Free Day. All right, so what we're going to start with, uh, Chapter 12, or excuse me, Chapter 11 is dealing with risk, toxicology, and our human health. All right, so when we look at health, health is basically a state of complete physical, mental, social, and spiritual well-being. And when I look at that one, it's basically, it uh, doesn't look primarily at diseases. It's just your basic uh, state of being at that time. Okay, when you look at a holistic concept of health, basically we're recognizing our strengths based on our social, economic, political, and environmental influences that are dealing with our health systems at this time. Some of the things that we look at, we look at the determinants here. And think about this, when you go into a doctor's office, they're going to ask you lots of questions. Love those questions. And some of the questions have to go back to family history of diseases. Uh, I, does your family have any history with cardiovascular disease? Are there uh, uh, any family members who have had cancer? Etc. So when they go in there and they also ask you questions about your lifestyle. Uh, what kind of foods do you eat? What kind of beverages do you drink? One question they kept asking me was about the amount of sodas. So that's why I tried to cut back on my intake of sodas and now I'm drinking predominantly water. Okay, so they'll ask these questions in there to kind of get an idea of what's going on on your health and to see if these factors will affect your quality of life. When you look at a disease, basically disease is an interaction between man, agent, and the environment. So here's some vocabulary that we've talked about in the past units. When you look at bioaccumulation, bioaccumulation is basically where a, um, a pesticide or a um, type of pollutant is basically absorbed into a plant life and working its way up the food chain up on a trophic level and as it goes up on that triangle it's going to accumulate as it goes up more and more is actually going to accumulate biomagnification is looking at the intensity or the uh, uh, the ramification of that particular disease in there and how it is actually being transmitted up like the amount of pesticides in there. A great example of this is with Rachel Carson with DDT. She did studies of how a particular type of bird, its eggs were thinning due to the amount of pesticides or that DDT was actually absorbed starting with plants working up to the first consumer, second consumer, all the way up to the tertiary which were these birds and notice that the actual offsprings were actually being killed or not making it due to the thinning of the actual shells. Uh, acute versus chronic. Remember I said on uh, on Monday, our last day we were together, acute is something that's sudden, real quick. Chronic means it's going to last a long time, like chronic back pain. My exposure with uh, the amount of low white blood cells, I have a chronic condition right here where it actually um, uh, where with medicine I can control it people with diabetes that would be a chronic exposure or chronic illness where dealing with medicines that can live with it for a long amount of time acute is something that's quick sudden where it's an onset where the diagnosis is coming back and it's not very favorable at that time Persistent is something that is like this gnat that's like buzzing in your ear. Persistence is something that's ongoing and it's there and doesn't end. Okay, so here we have the epidemiological tri uh, triangle that we have here where the factors that are being affected with our health are the environment, our agents, and of course us, the host. When we look at hazards, hazards are anything that's going to cause injury, death, or create a disease that could affect uh, my health down the road. It could also damage your property. Think about all the hazards out there with the ice. If too much ice uh, accumulated or snow accumulated on a building, it could damage, it could cave in. Destruction to the environment. Uh, if we had lots of water over, over time, it could uh, create potholes, it could create uh, sinkholes, things like that. Uh, 
or not necessarily sinkholes, but it can create um, uh, wear away and take away some of the sediments in there to create pockets where the, the soil will loosen up and, and actually fall down. Uh, cultural hazards. It could also be a risk that a person chooses to engage in. Uh, for example, a cultural hazard could be where I drink too many sodas there uh, because I love the taste of the sodas. It could be another factor where I'm in a particular country and I'm eating that particular food, but that food might be a hazard to me because I might down the road build up some kind of resistance or, or not necessarily a tolerance with it. Risk are probably or the probability of suffering either one, that injury, disease, or death, two, that damage to the property, or three, that destruction to the environment as a result of some hazard that has been created. And perceptions are what people think the risks are. Uh, to someone maybe drinking five sodas is nothing, but to some who don't drink any sodas, they're like, oh, Oh wow, that that's really too much for you. So it's again that perception of what people believe the risks are. Uh, we're going to look at the different types of hazards. We're going to start first of all with biological hazards here, then look at chemical and then physical. So biological hazards, there are numerous ones. So we're going to start first of all with the waterborne diseases. Most of the waterborne diseases are found in developing countries. Uh, impoverished areas and they're usually transmitted in our drinking water okay and uh, the the disease organisms are shed into the water uh, basically through feces of other animals or um, could be human feces as well it can produce an illness in those who consume that untreated or contaminated water there is a YouTube video I will try to link that one on there for you to watch um, uh, in Edmodo. Okay? Um, we have another one. Now, uh, another way that biological hazards or waterborne illnesses can be uh, passed on is through your water treatment facilities. Uh, of course, in the United States or most developed countries, we have very good, very reputable uh, water treatment facilities where our water has been zapped uh, with UV light to kill any bacteria that's in there. They put chlorine in there to kill any other bacteria that might be in there that maybe the UV light didn't get. So there's lots of ways to clean the water. But when you go to a developing country, they don't have these facilities to purify their water. Uh, another way of uh, treating it is by filtration, and that's probably the first way, and then, of course, the disinfectants. All right, now let's look at some of these um, waterborne illnesses that can be uh, contracted. Uh, polio. Believe it or not, polio is uh, transmitted or passed through with uh, water. Hepatitis A, salmonella, uh, shigella. Cholera. Now, cholera is a big one, so I'm going to pause on that one. Um, back in England, and with the turn of the century, and I will, again will try to show you that video of Jon Snow. Uh, with the cholera epidemic, basically what has happened is uh, they had a particular region where a lot of folks were getting sick, and they thought that this illness was spread through air. But Jon Snow, who was the father of epidemiology, figured out and said it's got to be the water and he figured it out because one particular pump which is located near a pub actually had good you know people did not die from drinking that water but all around it they were dying and they were getting their water from a different well whereas the pub was just had their own specific water. What John Snow figured out was something had contaminated. It might have been raw meat, other other factors that got into the water, and it caused people to die. They actually had uh, severe diarrhea within a couple of days. Uh, with throwing up, having severe diarrhea, they didn't hydrate themselves, and then they died within a couple of days. Uh, he figured it out, stopped it, and uh, the YouTube video will show the pub and the places along that one. Okay. Uh, another one is uh, amoebic dysentery, and again, that's dealing with some kind of bug uh, parasite that's in the water. You're drinking it, and it gets 
um, ingested. Uh, Giardia is another one that's pretty rough. It's another parasite that is in the water in these developing countries. And Cryptosporidium is another one as well. All of these we're going to kind of look at later when we look at diseases. Now, what happened, another big outbreak that really reached the media was uh, one that happened in Ontario, Canada. Um, this particular town, uh, Walkerton, uh, actually had a strand of E. coli. Okay, And so with that one, remember, E. coli is found in your feces as well. And with that one, uh, the, the uh, E. coli actually got into the public water supply and became contaminated. Uh, let's go back. Six people died, and look at this. Over thousands of people were infected with that one and reached an epidemic uh, proportion, and it reached the media. Okay. Uh, here again is just showing you the E. coli, what it looks like right here. And when E. coli gets into your system, if it's not your own E. coli, being exposed to other types of e uh, other people's and other animals' E. coli, it actually can cause bad things within your stomach. It's going to uh, create, as you can see right here, explosive emissions from either end of your digestive tracts. Ooh, just the thought of that one. People throwing up, having severe diarrhea. And it's not just necessarily E. coli. Let's, let's back up because in Pitt County about five or six years ago, we had an epidemic with the Norwalk virus. And uh, here's Giardia. But right here, the Norwalk and the rotavirus, both of those were found very common in Pitt County Memorial Hospital. They were transmitted there. People, again, it's transmitted by fluids, by liquids, by waterborne, meaning people did not wash their hands. They were transmitting it that way. And... Um, coming in contact that way and I remember my mother she became dehydrated had severe diarrhea she passed out woke up the next morning um, and then uh, we took her to the hospital she was in the hospital there were gurneys of people out in the hallway it was really it was really scary but luckily she was just dehydrated she did not have the Norwalk virus or the rotavirus both of those were very prominent here in eastern North Carolina so so whenever you get sick and you have a, a severe diarrhea or you're throwing up, you need to hydrate yourself. Drink lots of fluids, specifically water. If not, then that is one way that people die with this. Okay. Uh, here's one. Yes, you've been waiting for this one. The guinea worm. The guinea worm. And I will show you the video on that one. It's rather grotesque. And with the guinea worm, what has happened is in this particular country, again, the guinea worm, uh, it's in the actual water. It's uh, the, the larvae is swimming around into the water. People with open sores on their feet or just drinking the water, it actually gets ingested in there. It travels down the length of their legs, and when people are walking, they immediately will go to the water to get more to get more water to consume, and that's where it just burst out to try to find the water. Uh, and it's just really bad. Um, they've pretty much almost eradicated this. It is in parts of Africa that it's still there. This worm is actually will mature to be almost three feet long. Yes, three feet long. And it will pop out through blisters on your uh, feet and on your legs. And Miss Kempton is making faces at me because I'm talking about this one. It's pretty grotesque. And uh, what they happen is so painful you can't even walk. It's it's and so because their feet are on fire, they want to immediately immerse their feet in water, and that is a no no. You don't do that because that just draws it and creates the process all over again. So what they do is they'll take a little stick and they'll wind it up and they'll uh, wind it out slowly uh, until it's out. Uh, the skinny worm also will, grow, will go down the leg as it is right here. There's an opening right here and on your foot right there. And it will burst out and it will release other ova, which is other uh, eggs that are out there into the water and just create the cycle all over again. Okay, there is no vaccine for the guinea worm, uh, and people again do not build up a resistance because this is one that they can get reinfected over and over again. And uh, right now, the only there's no research for a vaccine, but what they're trying to do is educate people to stay out of the water 
and they're really uh, we're seeing lower and lower cases of this and again they wind it up on the stick each day okay and again you'll get the clip of the guinea worm I'll send that to you as well fun all right now we're going to uh, shift channels here to foodborne diseases and on this one it's like going to a restaurant you got to be careful with looking at those food codes that we have here so again with foodborne illnesses again we're looking at the local health department going in and remember they will grade restaurants they will grade any facility where food and other items like as such are in there um, another one they'll look at your restaurants supermarkets processing plants hey where the chickens are at and they'll cut them up the Tyson uh, chicken plants or any other processing plants where food is actually uh, bagged up and put out for market. And any places where they verify food, like how it's being stored and handled properly, all of that is very important. You don't want to... Uh, you want to watch your grades. Anything with the B grading or lower has got some questions there. So you really want to make sure you're eating and consuming places that have consuming food from places that have at least an A grading um, there. Uh, some other foodborne illnesses, again, salmonella, even though we said it's waterborne, is also a foodborne illness as well. Uh, so eating your eggs, when you go to a restaurant, ask for them to be fully cooked, scrambled, not over easy, because then if your yolk is runny, then you run that risk of getting problems or, or getting salmonella infections there. Uh, reptiles, believe it or not, eating alligator and other kinds of uh, turtle soup and things like that, those are considered, could be, if not cooked thoroughly, can be a problem. It is a delicacy, but you got to be careful. And also E. coli. Now, this is a story I heard from one of our um, health inspectors who came and talked to my class years ago, but he was saying that one of the biggest scares was the spinach scare out in California where the spinach actually had E. coli in it. Think about this. When you go to the grocery store and you buy those packages of, of lettuce and other kind of uh, bagged uh, uh, spinach and, and other kinds of uh, uh, salad products, those products right there, the workers are working in the field. But there's no bathroom there. Think about it. There might be a port john or they might have to go out in the woods. But there's no place to wash their hands. They're on the clock. They get out there. Yes, Miss Kimden's looking at me again. And they continue chopping that lettuce, chopping that spinach, and not disinfecting their hands. So this is why it's so important. Even if it's bagged up in that nice little packaged bag that you think your lettuce is clean, you need to wash everything because you don't know. And that is what happened with the spinach scare. There were workers. They had... Um, uh, they did not wash their hands, they were not sanitary, and therefore E. coli was spread through that one. Remember we also had the scare with the Peter Pan. Peter Pan peanut butter also had salmonella in it as well. So you got to be careful. All of these are restaurants or places or food products where there was a big item. The undercooked meats, the jack-in-the-box. Now we don't have those locally, but I believe they're up north. Is that correct, ladies? Are they up north? I think they are. But the Jack and Box had a problem where their hamburgers were not cooked fully. People had a problem. They were getting sick, going to the hospital. They had E. coli poisoning. Okay, any questions with foodborne? All right, so we're going to move on now with vector borns. And this is where insects and other, other types of uh, small critters are actually will bite humans, bite animals, and transmit it that way. Okay, so one of these examples, of course, is mosquitoes. Mosquitoes can spread malaria, but these are some others, encephalitis, and there are various grades of encephalitis that we have here. Of course, we know of the West Nile virus. When you go outside, off, uh, the other products was uh, DEET and other kinds of mosquito repellents are, are really pushing for the uh, 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 repelling of the mosquitoes from biting you so you won't get West Nile virus. It has been seen in certain parts of the United States. Of course, fleas. Now, we go back during the bubonic plague there. Fleas, that was how the bubonic plague was actually spread. Through fleas. Fleas actually bit the um, 
fleas actually bit the mice and then the mice or rats in turn um, bit or transmitted it uh, up to, to humans as well. And also typhus is another one. This diagram does show the, how it has actually uh, traveled from the vector all the way up. And you can see places where malaria is rampant. Now, if you are born, like one of my friends, Miss Singh, who used to teach here, when she would go over to India or visiting family overseas in areas where malaria was, was rampant, um, she did not have to get vaccinated against that. But if I were to go into travel into India or parts of these countries that are in the red, I would have to have malaria, either uh, vaccines or have to take medicines to kind of um, prevent myself from developing that. I believe Miss Singh's children also had to take uh, precautions there as well. Some other vector-borne diseases that we have as well are human-to-human, -human, uh, such as SARS, uh, TB, tuberculosis, HIV, any of the STDs that are out there, it's human to human, so you've got to be careful and protect yourself. TB is one of those that when I think of TB, okay, I get exposure to that. I have to take medicines for, for months and months and months, but actually there are certain strands of tuberculosis that there is no type of medicine to treat that and is very fatal, especially seen in the... Um, uh, developing countries in the third world countries. There was an episode on Frontline on tuberculosis and it is earth shaking right there. It really brings it into uh, an awareness that tuberculosis is something that is very uh, uh, very alarming um, on there. You can see areas where it is highest and again the, the episode on Frontline is focused in on parts of Africa where when you develop this form of tuberculosis, it's, there are certain strains of tuberculosis but the one that they're addressing in that episode is one that there is no cure it's basically get them as comfortable and then they die within a couple of weeks. It's very, it's very sad. Uh, some other uh, vector-borne illnesses that we have is the flu. The flu is one that is really um, concerned, and uh, I remember the N1, H1 virus that we took, the, uh, the, the uh, flu uh, vaccine that we took a uh, couple of years ago. Uh, came into play because there was a, supposedly the swine flu was making a comeback. Well, in the early 1900s, the swine flu came in and thousands, look at this, actually two, 20 to 30 million people were actually killed worldwide. And so because of that episode, then the flu is considered to be one of the biggest killers today in our world. So we got to be careful with that one. So that's why there's question. A lot of people are, are skeptical of taking the flu shot. I personally take it, remember, with my uh, immune system already compromised. The flu shot to me is just an extra episode, um, an extra precaution that I have in order to prevent me developing the flu. But you run that risk because they think they know what the strand is going to be like. Sometimes you get it and sometimes you don't. But basically a million people per world are um, infected with the flu, uh, get it, and, and in most cases it can be fatal. So you got to be careful. 20,000 people in the U.S. died uh, from the flu. So it's one of those things. So, ways that diseases can be spread, number one, going across across the pond, going over there to another country. You run the risk of developing illnesses in other international travels. Migration to urban areas, going from one area, maybe you're in a rural area secluded by yourself, and then you go to a big open urban area, subways, etc., and then you might get um, contract illnesses that way. Migration to uninhabited areas and deforestation because you're driving out um, the critters and the animals there. So a lot of uh, uh, problems can uh, occur there. Hunger, malnourishment, uh, um, that can be a problem as well. Um, also increase rice cultivation. I believe with the rice cultivation is with uh, areas that have a lot of water. Uh, then you run the risk of mosquitoes and other vectors that could spread it that way, other insects. Global warming has been contributed with that because with increased 
temperatures, then you're looking at a longer life with the um, critters, uh, with the insects. Hurricanes and high winds can also spread uh, these um, insects or spread other uh, particles that could get in the air and spread them to other regions and also accidentally introducing these into areas. This is where your invasive species can be there and also with flooding. We've had a lot of water here. I'm sure this summer we're going to see a high increase of mosquitoes and other insects that are going to be rampant even though we've had it rather cool. Uh, another one, increased research uh, reducing. So these are ways I can reduce the spread of diseases. So I can research uh, and I can also figure out and try to develop uh, vaccines to prevent it, um, reduce poverty, malnourishment, uh, maybe have the World Health Organization or uh, the Red Cross come in and kind of help people who are dealing in these conditions. Here's a big one right here, improved drinking water. Going in there, digging wells, not using the streams, the creeks, the rivers, but actually drilling wells and having that groundwater that is naturally filtered will give them cleaner, pure water. Uh, and also reduce unnecessary use of antibiotics. Remember me saying in class about my friend who they had... Um, uh, their daughter had gone through uh, puberty a lot earlier due to antibiotics being used in, uh, in animals, uh, specifically cows. So drinking the milk, the doctor immediately said start drinking organic milk. And she saw the trends or the, 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 um, the puberty signs actually decrease after that. Uh, educate people. That's the biggest one. Education is so key. Uh, making sure that you take all of your antibiotics. How many of y'all are guilty, think of this, of taking, getting sick, taking an antibiotic. You're supposed to take it for 10 days, but by the seventh day, you're like, man, I'm tired of taking this. I already feel good. So you stop. So you killed most of the bacteria or other things that are in your body, but you don't kill them all, and you're just building a resistance to that. And reduce that antibiotics use in the livestock that goes back to the um, use of the antibiotics. And washing hands. They had found out that in the turn of the century with surgeries that by people just washing their hands with soap and water, they were able to save so many lives with that. That is so crucial. So washing your hands all the time is, is crucial on there and slow global warming try to come up with alternative methods there um, and increase uh, the preventive methods um, there um, now let's move on to chemical hazards so we looked at biological hazards now let's look at chemical hazards and chemical hazards are those chemicals that get into our air water and soil and also into our food and look at this. Humans have been exposed to small amounts of about 500 synthetic chemicals that are processed in laboratories. Now, when you see the word epidemiology, I want you to think it's the study of diseases. So if I am an epidemiologist, I am someone who's going to study diseases in a particular region, something that is causing people to become sick. Uh, you're looking at uh, how many people or animals have diseases, the outcome of the diseases, and the factors, uh, and the distribution of the diseases. Here's one with rabies. Now, rabies right now has been on a, um, they've done a really good job with the epidemiology and studying the cases and trying to reduce the amount, but we do know that rabies it has been a problem in the past in the United States. And here you can see where the cases were in 2001. Now, with um, rabies, it's basically an animal that has been infected. It causes neurological problems. The animal becomes rabid, I mean, becomes uh, salivating at the mouth. And instead of running away, as most wild animals do, they'll actually run at you. They're not afraid. And so that's where these animals will actually become very aggressive and will actually fight or, or attack you. Some of the animals that have uh, been infected by rabies that we've got to be uh, concerned about are the raccoons, skunks, foxes, coyotes, 
and also baths. So when we look at this particular region right here, you can see on this map where the raccoons, the skunks, foxes, and coyotes have been um, infected or where there are large cases of these. So on the eastern seaboard, our biggest concern are raccoons. Okay, and I'm going to kind of move on through this one just to give you another one. Now, in looking at our hazardous case, uh, hazardous chemicals, excuse me, one of the things that epidemiologists do in laboratories is test out with different chemicals to see how much of it can be considered toxic or fatal. And this is called LD50. And I want you to think of the word, the number 50 here, by thinking 50%. So what they're going to do, they're going to give a substance up to a point and to where 50% of the test animals will actually die out uh, and they'll determine that because of the size and the magnitude of the uh, amount of chemical, at that point, that's when that particular toxin becomes fatal. And that's how they know how much of a dosage that you got to stay away from. Like, for instance, Tylenol. Tylenol has a, it's a great um, product there, but if you overdose on Tylenol, what they have noted is in lab uh, animals, and also they have seen this in humans, that after a certain amount of the particular dosage, your liver will turn to mush, and then people will have liver failure, and then they'll be in the hospital, and sometimes it can lead to fatal conditions on that one. So um, that's what I'm saying. The LD50 is how much of a dosage you can actually tolerate without it causing any kind of fatal implications. So what we have right here, some of the animals or some of these studies that they have done is uh, they've looked at uh, lab rats. That has been one. But they're trying to do uh, other kinds of methods. They're now looking at bacteria. They're looking at stem cell research. Uh, they're looking at chicken egg uh, uh, membranes that are in there. And this right here, this graph does demonstrate and show the LD50. So at this dose going up about midway right here, they can make a marker right here, determine that at 50 grams of this particular substance, uh, or 50%, you can see right over here, 50% of the substance sub subjects have uh, have died from this, and they can come down and determine the dosage down here to determine the LD50, the lethal dose of that particular substance that they've injected. There is some validity with this. Um, you got to remember, no two people are the same physiological, and a lot of times when they look at this, they will use uh, usually um, laboratory animals rather than human uh, subjects in this. Um, and, and definitely one thing that they will never do is uh, uh, subject a pregnant woman to any kind of laboratory uh, uh, testing at that point because that is, you know, ethics there. It is definitely a no-no. Um, so one of the things, they definitely look at the, the animals. And this just shows you some of the toxicity levels of different uh, items and their LD50 on there. Um, toxicology, when we look at this one, very little is known. Uh, only 10% of 75,000 chemicals have been screened. There are tons that are out there. Only 2% have been determined to be a carcinogen, teratogen, or a mutagen. And we're looking at uh, about more than 1,000 new synthetic chemicals are added each year that's out there. So you got to be careful. Buyer beware. A lot of times when you go to the uh, drugstore or you'll go to the uh, just the supermarket, a lot of things that are over the counter, majority of times they are not tested by the FDA. So you got to be careful on that one. They are not regulated. So buyer beware. you got to really figure out what they're saying. If they say natural, anybody can say natural. But there's certain plays on words, and we'll talk about that one, as to what is uh, considered okay. Um, this right here shows you your dose response curves. This one I like to talk about. This is Miss McClung. Now, back in the day when I would have a headache, I would take one, maybe two uh, Advils. 
Okay, nowadays for me to really kill that particular type of headache, I probably need to, or inflammation that I might have, I need to take four. And basically, this is your dose. How much of a dose does it can you take before you're starting to get a response from it? If I'm taking a placebo, it's probably going to be a flat line because nothing's going to react to it. My mother was in a... Um, uh, a a clinical trial with Celebrex, which is an anti-inflammatory drug. Um, to, and again, they were on the, uh, did that test for like, um, did the trial for 10 years. Remember, all drugs, in order to get FDA approval, has to be monitored for a minimum of around, I'd say around 10 years. But anyway, Celebrex, she was given the actual drug. My Aunt Mary was given the placebo. And for this one, they monitored the amount of doses until she was able to get a relief, a definite significant response to that particular medicine. And that's what dose response curves basically are. At what point is this dosage needed to where you're getting a relief of the pain or some kind of signal that it's doing what it should be doing. Okay. Um, there are things called endocrine disruptors and these are things that affect your endocrine system in there like with your reproductive, neurological, your immune systems in the body. And there are things that are natural out there that can also uh, be linked and can be connected with uh, cancer causing agents. Some of these endocrine disruptors that are out there are your paints or plastics that are found out there. Some of your detergents that are being used, flame retardants, and some additives that are in food products, toys, and even, yes, your cosmetics. So be careful. And they have found these endocrine uh, disruptors. Okay, now let's look at the uh, different classes of hazards. Let's look at the first one right here, a <laughs> mutagen. Mutagen is where something is in there and is causing some physical changes to the DNA or RNA in the cells. Okay, uh, teratogens, which are these type of chemicals that are ingested and they're going to cause harm to the unborn uh, baby, um, to the fetus in there. So it's really important, like the first three months, teratogens. Um, and remember me talking about Mad Men, you know, I love the show, but the women who are smoking, drinking, and yes, they know they're pregnant, but that was back in the 60s. And, and think about this, other chemicals that are out there. I think when women now are told that they're pregnant, the doctors will say, please stay away from these particular items. Okay? Uh, another one, a teratogen, again, being exposed with rubella. Uh, here's another one, mercury. Mercury, uh, high levels of mercury, watching what you eat uh, with fish because fish, certain types of fish do have mercury as bioaccumulation that I had identified in there. And also the fetal alcohol syndrome is another one. So I'm going to uh, go through these. Uh, Minamata Bay is another example. Minamata Bay was actually found, was in uh, Japan. This particular company that was there actually uh, had a, a hazard that was there where the mercury was actually released into the uh, Minamata Bay, this particular area. And so the fishermen there had noted that changes in, and started eating the fish and noted changes into the, um, uh, into the, ooh, my phone's ringing, but anyway, I'll get that later. But with Minamata Bay, they realized that the high levels of mercury were in there, and where they really saw it was in the kitty cats and other animals that were eating the fish, but also with the women, their unborn babies, when, uh, actually, when they actually gave birth to the children, and the children were getting a lot older, they realized that they had neurological problems. So with Minamata Bay, the effects of mercury, this is a neurotoxin. So we got that. And I'll show you again that YouTube video as well. Post it on there for you to view that one. Okay. Carcinogens, again, are the leading uh, are, uh, cancer causing agents that are in there, uh, being exposed to secondhand smoke, uh, lung disease, um, items like that. The highest ri risk in the U.S. is, again, tobacco smoking. And so when we look at this one, morbid morbidity versus mortality. Morbidity is the incident of a disease 
uh, that um, uh, can be found in a particular population, whereas mortality, the incidence of death in there, the disease versus the actual death on there. Some carcinogen uh, agents that are in there, of course, tobacco smoke, uh, but we also have radiation, just exposure to high radioactive materials that are found within there, and also certain viruses that can cause carcinogens like HPV, cervical cancers, things like that, and that can, can, can cause prominent growth in malignant tumors in the body. Um, we have latent periods of where carcinogens, you could have exposure to that and not even see changes, but maybe down the road. Here's a great example from Miss McClung right here, laying out in the sun. I'm very uh, light skin right here, but back in the day, did we have any SPF in our suntan lotions? L good Lord, no. So there I am laying out with baby oil, iodine in there. Yes, get good old tan, suntan. And I am paying for it today with having to go to the dermatologist. You guys are so lucky in that majority of your face lotions and products that are out there all have SPF. So curiosity for me, meow meow, is to find out uh, the levels of, uh, of skin cancers down the road with your generation versus my generation on there. Uh, I'm going to bypass this. I'm going to come back and talk about the neurotoxins again tomorrow in class. And so what I'm going to do is stop right here and finish this one in class. If you have any questions, just let me know. All right. Thank you.